Alrighty, so everyone, please put your hands together. Give a big round of applause for our creative, versatile, and experienced speaker, Mr. Harsh Vardhan Mishra, sir. Welcome, welcome you, sir. I, Babravi Raji Sharma, welcoming you in this Hackfest workshop. On the behalf of all the DSC GGV members and all the participants presenting here, Heart full welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining. Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You're audible. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, before we start, uh, uh, I would like to give a quick uh, and brief introduction of you, everyone. So here is uh, our speaker, Mr. Harsh Vardhan Mishra, sir. He's here. He's a software developer with an experience in web development and analysis and content writing with expertise in web machine learning and cloud technologies. I'm telling you, he's a very enthusiastic person having a huge and huge career history. I really appreciate it, sir. I was amazed after seeing your profile on LinkedIn. So giving a brief on his uh, interns and all. So he's a product documentation intern in Red Hat developer outreach intern in deep source plus okay let's not talk about his huge certificates and skills because it's going to take an hour welcome you sir uh thank you so much for this introduction um i will straight up get with my slides because we are already late so let's let me just share my tab and if my voice is lagging at any particular point of time or if my slides are not visible, please let me know so that I can just fix up this stuff from my side. So can everyone just confirm if my slides are visible yes. or if I'm clearly yes. audible? You're clearly audible and your slide is also visible. Sure. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, we will have this session really slow because we have a lot of things that we can possibly discuss. So if you're having any questions, any doubts, just put it on the chat and I will look onto it on an immediate basis. So good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining for this session on technical architecture for Hackfest, uh, which I came to know is a week long series for uh, technical development and learning about it. So in this session, we will be discussing a lot about uh, technical architectures how you can model the architecture for your upcoming projects with a focus on usability, reliability, and scaling. So if I start talking about things from a very rudimentary perspective, a technical architect is basically a project manager who oversees the enterprise infrastructure project. So you can just refer them to as an enterprise or a solution architect. And their primary job is to plan, design, and implement an architecture. It can be on AWS, it can be on Google Cloud, it can be on Azure, it can be on Hadoop or anything else. They plan the data flows and the movement and ensure that the project runs very smoothly. Now, these type of people have been computer programmers, developers, and they have some kind of technical knowledge and they are much, much different from the product managers. So this is because they are not the ones dictating the features that we are looking to have in a project. They are the ones that are translating the basic ideas and design into pure code that would form a part of their offering. So in a changing technical environment, organizations face the need to transform their processes and systems to meet the business requirement. And this, Technical architecture allows the companies to meet their business requirement in a scaling mode. 
So this digital transformation demands a specific expertise, a set of practices that would simply allow you to scale your application according to the needs. So today your application might have a few hundred users. After a month, your application might have a few hundreds and thousands of users. So how can you exactly scale up to that level? This is what we will be discussing in this session on technical architecture. So as a technical architect, we have to learn on how to think of architecting a project from a scratch. So let's say we have a set of features. We know who the users of the product are. And now we have to take a look onto every aspect of the product and we have to implement it. So in this session, we will discuss technical architecture as a whole, rather than how to become a technical architect because becoming a technical architect is simply beyond my own scope as of now. So with this session, you will get started with planning out your projects and starting work on them. So a practical exposure to things are a really good way to gain some experience. So we will be trying to have a look onto getting some practical experience rather than uh, just jumping on the theoretical aspects of it. So I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the team at DSC Guru Kasidas University for inviting me for this session. And I am elated to be delivering this talk right now. So let's start off with our interaction. So my name is Harsh and I'm an intern at Red Hat with the OpenShift team. And I'm working as a developer outreach at DeepSource. Um, coming to my prior experience with technical architecture and development, uh, I have been a fellow at Major League Hacking. I have been uh, a software engineer intern at QXF2. And I was also a summer intern at Scholify, where we basically scaled an application from 700 users to more than 1 lakh users within a few months. So I have some experience with developing and scaling projects for the past one and a half years. And most of the things that I will be talking today will be from my experience, uh, will, be, will be from my experience about developing projects and tools and scaling it to some set of users all across the world. So right now I'm working at Uptone um, as a backend engineering lead. And basically I architect product solutions for our applications and manage the team overall. So I will be speaking some of the things from my experience, as well as I will be speaking some of the things that are described on these slides. So since we are a small crowd, it would be great if everyone here can drop their introduction as well. It doesn't need to be super complex, just something that conveys who you are. Maybe your name and your year of study would suffice. This will just help you understand on what uh, technical skills you might have or what sort of experience you might possess. So you can just drop your name, your year of study, and everything else will be fine. Cool. There is a lot of enthusiasm here. OK, so others had a question like, uh, I'm pretty interested in machine learning and AI. Can you tell us how we can implement this in website or apps? Uh, we have a feature for that. Once we will do the case study about developing our own application, we need a feature where we need to capitalize upon some of the machine learning uh, parts. So we will discuss about how we can do that uh, from an external service. And I will also talk if you want to do it from an internal service, like maybe develop something of your own. We will come on to that part. Cool, so we have a lot of people and majority are from the first or the second year, I suppose. So that's quite good. Uh, thanks, Abhijit, for having me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I guess we can get started. So thank you everyone for introducing. So let's get started up. So since I expect that most of you are from the computer science or the information technology department, or maybe someone just interested in programming, I can guess one thing for sure. You must have thought of building an application at some point of time. Can I just have a quick yes or a no? Yes, if you wanted to build an application of yours, or no, if you just want to go with a traditional job and like work on someone else's application. So yes, there are a lot of people who want to develop their own application. And nowadays there is an app for everything. If you want to just speak out of your mind, you can go to Twitter. If you want to give a professional update, you can go to LinkedIn. If you want to share your photos or status, you can go to WhatsApp or Instagram. So. If you are like me, you have more than once thought of a great idea for an application. In my first year, since 
I am a student from North India, like I'm based in Darjeeling. I have a trouble speaking a lot of native languages. I cannot even speak Bengali properly. And I went to study at Chennai. And at Chennai, everyone is speaking either Tamil or English. So I had a pretty lot of problem in having conversation with the native people, like in the Tamil language. So I wanted to build a bus scheduling application because I was not able to speak in Tamil. I wanted to have a direct conversation with some of the conductors so that I can secure a seat in that bus. So I wanted to have an app through which I can book state bus tickets directly from my smartphone. And I could not make that idea possible because I simply didn't have the expertise about that. Uh, I did not know how to make an app. I did not know even some of the basic programming languages that I should be using for making that application. The very first production ready app that I built was at the end of my first year of college as a PHP developer intern at a local sales and support company. So many of you might say that PHP is pretty outdated or it doesn't have any type of coercion, but some people might come up with weird jokes that PHP is far too difficult or even messed up to learn. And that brings us to an ultimate truth about building something. We always look for a unified technology to build our apps. So no matter if it's optimized to solve the problem or not that we have at hand, we are looking for just one technology. So let's say you want to build a social media app. So you will start uh, asking if we can use MeanStack for this, maybe MongoDB, Express, Angular, and Node, or shall we go with MonStack? like uh, MongoDB Express, React and Node, or shall we go with something else like Django or Flask or even PHP or Laravel? So there are a lot of options, but the one thing that we completely miss out is that how these options are optimized for the problem that we're trying to solve. So no matter if it is optimized to solve the problem or not, we are always looking for one unified technology stack. If you're looking to build a web app, we can only think of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. If it is a front-end framework, like uh, if it is a web application that is scaling too much, we can think of a front-end framework or library like Angular or React. Similarly, for Android, we have got Java, Kotlin. And nowadays, we have some hybrid frameworks like uh, Flutter or Xamarin or React Native. But the one thing that we need to realize is that we no longer delve into a monolithic architecture. And remember monolithic, microservices, serverless, these are not something related to any programming languages. These are development models. And these development models are simply larger than any language or the framework that you're using. So let's go back into, into the history, maybe to 1980s or 1990s, where companies like Microsoft, uh, like these companies use data centers with physical servers and they used to run monolithic applications that was developed using traditional waterfall methodology. So if you're not familiar with software engineering as a subject, uh, waterfall is a methodology where we define all the requirements at the first and the teams start building upon those requirements. So waterfall methodology is not very flexible uh, for any sort of change that we may encounter at some point of time. So a monolithic application can be just constructed as a single unit, means it is composed in all in one piece. And you can just describe it as a one tire software application with which different components can be combined into one program in a single platform. So with monolithic application, you can easily test the application, you can debug them, and you can even deploy it very easily. But now, it's extremely problematic to use new technology in a monolithic application because the whole application has to be rewritten. So if you develop a complete social media application using just PHP, let's say like Facebook, and now you want to add some new features to it, you might need to rewrite the whole application from the scratch. And this is something that most of the modern development teams might not want because this might attract a lot of technical debt and the whole company might go bankrupt. After monolithic, we came with the idea of microservices. And the idea of microservices is to separate our application into some small sets and interconnected services rather than just one monolithic application. So you can just consider microservices to be something like a module where we have a business goal 
where it has a simple defined interface and these interfaces can communicate with each other. And right now microservices is something that every company is using for powering their applications. So it means that if you go to any company, there would be a lot of teams. Every team would be building the selected services according to the programming language of choice or the framework of your choice. And they are working independently. If I take the example of Amazon, there are a lot of teams. Every team is using a different technology stack. Some is using Python, some is using Java, some is using JavaScript. And still they are working on a unified software in spite of using different languages or frameworks. So with microservices, you get to work on a loose coupling of services. That means you can simply use different technology stack and you can just use one interface to have all of them communicate with each other. And since business requirements change every time on a weekly or even on a daily basis, you can uh, make this happen by building, delivering, producing and responding to that change very fast. So let me just show you on what a complex architecture would look like. So we have got this paper right here that I was reading today and this is Borg and it basically runs both the internal and the external Google Cloud. And it essentially can run any kind of production workload, uh, spread those workloads over a cluster of computers and juggle between scheduling, resource management, health checking, priorities, quota and everything. Now, this is a monolithic architecture. And this system has a near 24 into seven hours uptime. And this means that if it goes unavailable at any particular point of time, it is a disaster for Google. It also has a hundred of features together at the coding level. So if you're making any changes to it, it is very, very complex. And you had to hold so much state in your head in order to reason about safety, about any little coding change. Because if you're introducing a small change that might break a lesser known feature used by some other team around the world. So this is how problematic the monolithic architecture can be when you start uh, working around them. So with something like a microservices architecture, you can make sure that you have some small, discrete, loosely coupled units and you can just make use of them. And microservices isn't just another technical architecture that we need to follow. Tons of companies and enterprises using different technologies stack for different purposes. Some are still following a monolithic architecture, while some are pretty much following the microservices pattern. And while there are companies that are shifting to serverless, it simply means that they can just work on the development part, no need of configuring any servers and all. So some companies are also shifting to the serverless architecture. So as a software engineer or as an architect, you need to ensure that you, you don't fall into the trap of a single unified technology stack and inherit all the technical depth from it. So what are the basic aspects of an application that we need to think of and consider? Let us take the popular example of LinkedIn. So if I just go to linkedin.com, uh, you open a web browser, you just hit Chrome or Firefox. I'm using Chrome right here. And you enter the URL in the address bar like LinkedIn.com and you simply hit enter. So once you do that, you basically send a hypertext transfer protocol request that you're making to the LinkedIn server. So you are essentially asking a remote computer managed by LinkedIn to return the data that is stored on its hard drive for displaying it on your web browser. And guess who receives the request? The LinkedIn server. So once the LinkedIn server receives a request, it performs various checks with the request data that it receives from you, like who is making the request or uh, what is the timestamp of it and each and every detail. So these type of checks are written by the developers using a server side programming language. It can be PHP, it can be Django, it can be uh, Flask or it can be anything else. So once the server side program implement all of its logic related to your request, it returns the appropriate data to your web browser. And this data is present in an HTML format. This is a data that's something your uh, browser understands. And this part of the web is categorized as the backend development part. So the HTML data is nothing but the LinkedIn profile page that you see on your web browser. It is made looking pretty by using some sort of a client side programming language. And the good examples of that are CSS and the JavaScript. So these client side languages 
get executed on your browser and not on the server. And this part of the web is categorized as a front end. So just remember front end is something that you can directly see, you can directly interact with, but it isn't necessary that you can interact with the backend directly unless and until you're using some APIs for that. So as you notice, every single application follows a similar pattern for development. Every application has got a front end, it has got a back end, it has got a data storage, something like a database, and it has got some other services as well. So LinkedIn has got a ton of integrations. Let's say that you're building your own company for marketing and sales over LinkedIn. So let's say that you have a ton of processes that need to be automated. So you cannot rely on some sort of a scraping for that, or just manually having all these processes running. So you can make use of something called as an API, basically an application programming interface. And this is an abstraction layer through which LinkedIn can share the data to its users and services in an easy manner. So today, every application makes use of a front end, a back end, a database, and an API that can be either integrated to your application or offered through the application itself. So I see that there is a question that what about API? So let us take a very simple example for this. Suppose you have gone to a site. It can be an e-commerce site. It can be a blog site. It can be something else. And you see an option like on Facebook. Once you click on that, you can just directly go to the Facebook page of that product or that blog and you can directly like to it. So how does two different services are exactly communicating features among each other? Because Facebook like is a feature that is specific to Facebook. Uh, it has got nothing to do with that e-commerce site or with that blog application. So it turns out we are using something called as an API, an application programming interface. And basically this API allows you to have an abstraction over your application. So with this API, you can share the data to an external user who might be or who might not be using your application directly. So that ensures that uh, you don't have to serve a lot of requests just because something wa someone wants some data from your application. You can directly serve that data to the end user by giving them an, uh, by giving them an API response. This is how easy it is. Uh, if you want to test some APIs, uh, there are a lot of APIs available on the net. Uh, one of them is this random user generator. So it is an open source API and you can just try it out to basically practice about APIs. And let me just tell you, APIs are the fundamentals for backend development. So if you want to be a backend developer, uh, you want to learn about backend development in general, make sure that you understand what an API is and how does an API work on its entirety. So you can just go over here, you can check out the documentation about how this API works and you can just start sending responses to it. This is normally how most of the APIs work. And in some of the backend developer interviews, you will be getting this website as an interview question. So take this website, it has got an API and try to query the data that has been generated from this API. So you can do that as well. Let me just share the link so that you guys can just try it out. Cool, so now whatever app you're building, So once you have decided upon a web application, should it be a web application or should it be a mobile application or should it be uh, something else, it's time to determine your tech stack. So let's see how we can actually do that. So let us take the example of a revolutionary app that we're looking to build today. And it is a photo sharing app. So now my product manager comes to me one fine day and says, hey, we did have, we have this user research and study, and we found out that the user to have a photo sharing app where they can store all their photos and share that with the others. And as a solution architect, as a technical architect, I'm like, yes, sounds good, definitely good. We know that we have some users who are willing to use our app. We have some proper research done by our product and the marketing team. And now we as an engineer want have to build this app and deploy it while letting the marketing team do their job of like giving it out to the users. But we are facing yet another existential crisis. And it is 
that we have failed to realize which technology stack do we need to use. But before we do that, there are a ton of other technical questions as well. How many users is this application going to serve? What are the specific client additional that we have to implement? Like, is this web application going to be supported by Internet Explorer? We have to test that up. What sort of hosting environment do we have? What sort of budget do we have? What are the metrics that we are collecting? Uh, are we going with the SQL database or a new SQL database? What sort of domain models we need to follow? What about the admin access? So as you might have guessed, we have a ton of questions and all of it forms part of our technical designing and the architecture part. We just cannot skip our question or two and jump upon deciding our technology stack and then into the coding part. Because once you figure the answer to this question, everything else would be a please. You can just pick up a technology stack, maybe a Java one or maybe a JavaScript one, and you can just start setting up the pipelines and start coding it up. So let's jump, let's jump into deciding the technology stack for our project uh, for this photo sharing app. So the very first thing that we can do is to define our client. So what exact environment are we going to serve this entire application? So in this case, we want it to be a web application, but then we need somewhere to host our backend and run our code. So we all developers face the difficulties with maintaining our own servers and scaling them properly. If you have watched the film, The Social Network, uh, which is based upon the life of Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg literally had to buy Linux servers and had to set up uh, those servers in his own home to basically power up the scalability of the Facebook as an application. So today's world is much more discreet. You cannot buy your own servers without wasting a lot of money on that. You will just try to rely upon a cloud environment so that you can just deploy your application and you can simply make use of it. So since we have to maintain an application, uh, we have to spend a lot of time and efforts if we are going to do it manually. So it's not just worth it. So imagine if you can just ship a function without any application setup, server management, extra billing, extra time, and effort for scaling. Wouldn't it be nicer? So now Google Cloud Function does that for you. You can just write a function and host it there. And then you can use it from anywhere by HTTPS calls or by events. So for that purpose, we use something that we call as cloud function. So cloud function is a tool that allows the developers to write a function in Python, Node, Golang, or whatever your preferred language is. And you can just serve it through the hypertext transfer protocol, the basic protocol that every single application on the internet is using right now. And the better part is that it can also handle the scaling for us. So it's really good for beginners looking to develop an application. We don't have to worry about manually configuring a lot of server. If, for example, let's say today we had 100 users and tomorrow we have like 10,000 users. We don't have to spend a lot of time on configuring our server. The uh, cloud function can do that for us in an automatic way. Another uh, technology that we can use here is uh, Firebase Firestore. We need something to store our user information like usernames, passwords, and all of that. And this is the reason why we can use the Firestore here. So Google Firestore is Google's singular NoSQL based database. And it is paired with a lot of other Firebase uh, features as well, like Cloud Functions, Firebase Auth, Firebase Storage. And it is a pretty attractive technology stack for developers and uh, engineers who simply want to get an application up and running within just a few hours. And it's also fully managed, means you can just handle all of that scaling uh, through this service itself. You don't have to configure anything on the manual side. And lastly, we need to store our photos somewhere because after all, it is a photo sharing app. And for that, we will use the Firebase storage. So this is Firebase Fire Storage System. It allows us to store our photos on the cloud and you can upload and share the user generated, generated content.
can anyone just confirm if my screen is visible? I dropped off for a second. No, sir, it's not visible. Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, sorry, I dropped off for a second. Uh, net issues on my side. Uh, let me just check. Yeah. So we were discussing about storing the photos on our database. So we can use cloud storage for that. Uh, you can store your images, your videos, and you can also build rich media content into your application. Everything can be pretty much configured through these services. So the Firebase is very simple. It is very powerful and it is very cost effective as well. If you're looking at a small scale and you can use software development kits uh, for adding file uploads, downloads, security and everything else. So Firebase can pretty much handle everything for you straight from storing images, audios, videos to also generating some user content pretty much automatically. So your data is stored in a Google Cloud storage bucket. Uh, to an exabyte scale object storage solution. And it has a very high availability, reliability, and a global redundancy. So with this cloud storage, you can upload these files on mobile devices or even on web browsers. And you can also spot uh, spotty networks with very ease. And that's it. This is our basic photo sharing application. But now, let's say we want to add some photo searching functionality like in google photos and if i remember correctly someone asked this question about how can we integrate machine learning to our application so now we need a feature through which the user can uh, find a particular photo by just describing it let's say that you click a photo of a dog uh, your favorite dog your pet and now you just want to find the picture of that dog in your photo gallery and you just don't want to manually scroll through a hundred of photos stored on your device. So you can make use of a machine learning uh, product to make that happen. So to do so, we can make use of a machine learning application programming interface. It is basically an abstraction over the service that is offered by Google. And that allows the user to use some pre-trained models in machine learning so that we can find out some objects or detect some faces or expressions, some geographic locations, and also some sensitive content. So with the Cloud Vision API, we can automatically create tags for all the images, and we can just search through all our photos with some key terms. And once we implement that, our application now has a similar feature to Google Photos in the true sense. If you're planning to integrate a machine learning API from your own site, you don't want to rely on any third party services, you can make use of machine learning models and you can just integrate them to some sort of a RESTful architecture. So if I just talk about Python, we have got plenty of frameworks and libraries like Flask, Django, Fast API. So you can have these models, you can integrate them to these APIs and you can just deploy them over the cloud and let any anyone over the internet make use of that API. So that's how easy it is to integrate your machine learning features into your application without having any sort of configuration whatsoever. So with this, your mobile application can run on Android. It can be on Java or Kotlin. And your machine learning feature can run on Python. So it is pretty much a microservices architecture that we're following right here. We are dividing our entire application into multiple loosely coupled services. And we are giving these services the charge of like get them back right into our application. So up until now, we were using all the services offered by Google natively. But what if we want to use our own frameworks? So your own custom backend or service deployed over the cloud. Well, the first question that might cross your mind is, why reinvent the wheel? If Google is already offering us so many services like Firebase storage or cloud functions, why exactly do we need to have, have our own thing? Why do we need to write our own code? But in some cases, we do need that. In cloud computing, there is a concept called vendor lock-in. And basically vendor lock-in simply means that your capabilities are restricted by the provider who is providing you with all these services. 
and Firestore and Firebase is basically the epitome of this idea. Firestore querying capabilities are very primitive. So it means that filtering, sorting or merging of data will happen on the client side, not on the server side. And this will increase your cost dramatically. I'm speaking this from my experience of developing applications for Firebase. Firebase also has this vendor lock-in problem, just like I stated before. So you can make use of it to build a quick minimal viable product that might come into the market. People can use it and test it. But if your application starts scaling and you need a more control over your application, Firebase isn't going to provide you that. And it is going to be hell expensive to have a scalable application on Firebase because there was this popular blog that Google sent a very large bill for someone who used Firebase for only three days. So if possible, I will share this uh, over the chat. And it is a very nice one. So yeah, so here was the blog that basically uh, Firebase sent him a $30,000 bill for uh, just using the Firebase architecture for the development part within the first 48 hours itself. So since I am restricted by the medium's reading list, maybe you can use that uh, on your own side and you can just read this blog to see how restrictive Firebase can be when it comes to scaling and when it comes to the cost effectiveness. But now we need something of our own. So for this purpose, you can use a popular web framework like Django or Express or Ruby on Rails or Spring. But now that you need to deploy it, you again have to make use of the Google Cloud. And Google Cloud has got something called as the App Engine Standard. So this is Google Cloud's platform as a service tool. And it allows you to upload your code and it handles everything else for you. So Google App Engine enables you to build and host web applications on the same system that powered the Google applications. So you will be using the same infrastructure that Google uses for its own purpose. And it offers very fast deployment, very fast development, a very simple administration. And you don't need to worry about anything like configuring servers or the hardware part or the scalability factor or anything else. So as you can see, you have a ton of choices to make. And if you take a deeper look into the individual tech stack, you can find the solution to all your problems like auto scaling, user retention, machine learning, and more of that. But now let's say that your current services doesn't support some features. So what exactly will you do? Let's take an example. Uh, the app engine standard doesn't support web sockets and it can be problematic for some users, so for some developers who are extensively making use of WebSockets for their application. So there is no worry about that because Google Cloud also has got App Engine Flexible. And this App Engine Flexible is different from the App Engine standard in a few ways. It supports WebSockets, but it's also much better at handling relatively sustained levels of traffic. App Engine standard, though, is much better at handling spikes of traffic. However, this whole flexibility comes at a price. The flexible environment is slower to deploy. You can't scale as quickly as a standard environment. And the default deployment is also overkill for prototyping. App Engine standard also takes like some 60 seconds to deploy your code, but the flexible environment almost takes five to 10 minutes of time. So with App Engine standard, if no one is using your application, it shuts everything down. And if a the moment a user visits your application, App Engine will spin up an instance in some few milliseconds to serve the new request. And if you're using the free tire, you don't really have to worry about the infrastructure cost for the prototypes. But in comparison, flexible environment needs at least one instance running to serve traffic and there is no free tire. So as you can see, there are a lot of offsets that you need to consider while deciding your technology stack and the way that you architect your solutions. And lastly, we might want to add different types of clients that can interact with backend, given our users access to the photos on all the devices. So it is not just a web platform right now. It can be a mobile application. Uh, it can be a smartwatch application. It can be a tab application. It can even be a desktop application. So as far as you can see, a revolutionary app requires hardware and software tools combined with a clear value proposition. 
and each crucial element layers on top of the other. So you have to provide everything needed to develop and maintain an efficient and scalable application. You cannot just say like, let's use React or Node or Django and build this app. There is a lot of considerations that you need to take care of if you wish to make your application on a long-term basis. And with this, we come to the uh, middle of this whole session. So if you have got any questions, you can just shoot them right now on the chat or you can directly unmute yourself. Before we start discussing on how can we exactly decide the technology stack and the approach of making a project. Yes, Adarva, I will basically take a look into your request, but it would be great if you can share uh, your problem with everyone here so that we can find a common ground about it. Uh, uh, hello, sir. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Sir, so uh, basically the problem is I am not able to figure out uh, the technical aspect uh, of making my project into a working prototype. Uh, okay. Uh, it is a long, quite long proposal, so I would not be able to explain here to everyone mm -hmm. what it does. So okay. That is why I requested you to take a look. Yeah, sure. So we will discuss this in this agenda of the session, like how to actually think about our proposals and how to yes, start sir. working sure. on these sure, uh, prototypes. Yeah. If there are any more questions, please directly unmute yourself. You don't have to be so formal. Uh, if there are no questions, you can just drop a yes. That would ensure that everyone is on the same page here and everyone is pretty much able to understand on what has been being discussed up till now. If there has been anything that you have not understood from a technical perspective, uh, do let me know so that I can just make it simple for your understanding. Uh, so we have like almost more than 50 people and like there are only four yes. <laughs> so come on guys, if there are any questions, just feel free to shoot to them right now. Okay, so um, I think... Uh, hello. Hmm. Hello, sir. Um, so I wanted to ask like, how do you decide which like for same purpose there are so many various options of technologies right so mm -hmm. how do you come with the conclusion which would be better in long run so uh basically i was going to discuss this in this in the next half of the session but let me just uh, make it compact so basically i will look into three things the first is how reliable the technology stack is so if I want to uh, have a scalable app, maybe I will go with a NoSQL database. And in NoSQL, we have got a plenty of options. We have got MongoDB, we have got DynamoDB. So the very first thing that I would look is how reliable it is. What is the community support? Uh, what is the enterprise support? And is it something that most people are using these days? So a few months back, we had got this very nice database. It was Datastax Astra. And we were asked to use it during the MLH fellowship. But since this database didn't have a lot of documentation, didn't have a lot of community support, uh, we simply de decided not to use it and decided to go with the standard MongoDB database. So the very first thing that you need to think of is the technology stack that you are going to use. Is it conforming to the modern standards of development or not? So maybe just take a look at onto some statistics on how many developers are actively using it uh, every year. Maybe just have a look onto some stack overflow pages to see like if people are actively asking questions about this technology stack, because that would show that people are actively using it. And if you run into any problem at some point of time, you will have some people who can actually help you uh, answer your questions about the same. The second is the reliability part. So how reliable the technology stack is. So as a solution architect, as a software architect, uh, you should be reading a lot. So read a lot of blogs, read a lot of articles, reading a, reading a lot of papers can basically help you to form an opinion about these technology stack. So I read a few papers every day, a few blogs every day, 
And as a beginner, the very good point for you to get started would be the system design interviews. So the system design interviews are basically for some experienced professionals, but you can read those blogs, those experiences yourself, and basically understand on how these technology stacks actually play out. Most of the system design interviews don't actually play out upon the technology stack, but around the core concepts of developing and scaling an application. So just to go over Geeks for Geeks, uh, there are a lot of system design questions uh, and system design interviews from some past companies. And there are a lot of interesting questions like how to design your own Uber app or how to design your own Instagram. So just have a look over it and form your idea that you have to achieve this and these metrics with your technology stack. So is the technology stack that you prefer or you're planning to use, is it exactly going to serve you the purpose? Like many of the companies have been using Ruby on Rails for developing their prototype. Some good examples are Twitter, GitHub, Airbnb. But what about that? But what after that? Many companies just shift their technology stack from Ruby on Rails to some other technology stack. So that shows that Ruby on Rails can pretty much configure a lot of things automatically for us but it isn't that good from a computing and a scaling aspect. So these are some of the things that you need to think of uh, if you're putting a technology stack into your bucket. So people say like go with mean stack or mon stack, but to be very honest, very few companies are actually using a uniform technology stack for your case. If I talk about Red Hat, we have got a lot of front end applications and we are pretty much using everything, React, Angular, uh, on the back end, we have got uh, Node.js, we have got Python, we have got Drupal, we have got PHP. So there are a ton of options and so it depends upon the user requirements, the user metrics and the expertise that the developer in the team holds. So if my team has got JavaScript developers, I cannot just say them like, let's make this application in Elixir because no one is exactly going to understand that. So I guess the uh, question has been answered. Okay, sir. So basically, you mean that uh, keeping in tab with what technology is used recently and the technological skills that we have in our team. Exactly. Thank you so much. So, yeah, that's a pretty generic way because once you get into the enterprise, uh, most of your time as an engineer will be spent upon creating POCs, the proof of concepts. So if someday you are proposing that let's use React for our next project, you have to spend a few nights upon developing a small application using React, showing it to your uh, product manager and basically convincing them that yes, React is a viable option for our case. Uh, yes, Nishant, deployment is confusing to a lot of us, but hopefully there are a lot of other third party services that are making deployment very easy for us. Like Netlify has got this feature of drag and drop. So just uh, zip your front-end application, drag it and drop it on the Netlify UI, and Netlify will automatically deploy it for you. It's that easy. Version has got import from GitHub. So just import a repository from GitHub and you can directly deploy it. So previously deployment was quite a hard nut if you have to configure the auto scaling, configuring a bare bone server, but right now it is pretty easy. But yes, it all depends upon the perspective. Cool, so now let's start with the next half of the session and it would be very small. And it would basically concern ourselves with a question on how can we do this? How can we architect that we are building, taking into account all the metrics that I have described before. So most of the experienced developers have got a preferred technology stack. You might be good in Java or JavaScript or even Python or React or something else. So it can seem like a daunting task. So the best way to navigate this world of technology stack is to find a resource or a subject matter expert that can guide you on your path. So while subject matter experts are mostly biased in the decision making, consulting an expert can be the best money spent and save you from the future headaches. Or if you're a solopreneur, you're just working alone on your entire project, there are some easy steps which would allow to define your requirements after all. And I'm going to describe those steps just to simplify your own process. So we will break down this into three components, consideration, research, and design. So let's take them head on individually. The very first part is consideration. 
as with any endeavor, you have to put, put the end user first. So just think everything from the user's perspective. How are they going to use the application? Where they are going to use the application? Uh, is your application going to serve only in the online mode or is it also going to serve on the offline mode? And everything else that might concern a user activity. Because a user's activity is a guiding factor in choosing the right technology stack for our purpose. And apart from this, take care of your development team as well. What experience or expertise do they hold? Have they ever worked at such a scale before? Or are most of them just fresh engineers straight out of college or maybe uh, doing an internship, something like that? Because it's important to understand your resources and limitation when choosing a tech stack for your app development. An amazing technology stack will mean nothing without the proper developers to use it. Most frameworks, development models, databases are pretty much open source, which simply means that they are free to use and they are widely available. Most open source entities allow for unrestricted use and provide the developer with a large canvas to paint on. And most of the application costs come directly from servers and hosting obligations. These are some things that you can consider while choosing your technology stack. In most of the cases, we are not preferred to go with any closed uh, license source because we would need to pay for it if, if you want to use it. Mostly we have to go with the open source development frameworks. So you can take that into consideration. The second aspects that you can possibly think of is your budget and your timeline. Maybe you need to build your entire project within two or three months. So you cannot go complete, you cannot have a complete focus upon the scalability part. You just need to do something pretty quick and pretty dirty. So maybe you can use a framework that is extensively used for that. Just like the example that I stated for Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails was pretty much used by every company back in uh, 2010s for developing their own MVP like Airbnb, GitHub, Twitter, and all. So you can take this into consideration as well. The second part is about security, compliance, and how much load does this service have to provide. If you're just developing this from the perspective of a minimal viable product, you might not need to think of the entire scalability part. You can just keep everything in a single API and you can just serve it. It is as easy as that. The second part is research. And understanding the needs of your application is the key to choosing the right technology stack. Size, scope, the complexity of your application may change the direction of your technology stack. If I take the example of small projects like minimal viable product or one page applications that can be perfect for well defined or that can be like uh, well defined. So you can basically use some open source technology stack like Python, uh, which has got Django and Flask or Node.js and even React. Adding complexity after that may affect your decision. So keep in mind that scaling your front of mind during the whole development process. You cannot just stick to one thing for the entire period of time. Medium projects like online e-commerce products or mid-market software applications require a bit more complex technology stack with multiple layers of programming languages and frameworks. So these are much like smaller projects but you have to keep the scalability at the forefront of your decision-making process because this is a key. And if you lose the key, the entire user base of your application will simply go off. Large projects, on the other hand, have complex maintenance. They are mostly like social media applications or enterprise level applications. And they require a more scaled technology stack to maintain the application integrity and the performance. So these large scale technology stack usually employ multiple layers of programming languages and frameworks while being built to the platform under high volume constraints. So you can do your own research. You can come up with your own list. Uh, at this link, bit.ly Google Cloud for words, you will find a popular tool called uh, Google Cloud Developer Cheat Sheet, which describes every Google, uh, basically which describes every Google Cloud tool in four words or less. And you can use this extension to basically find out all the Google developer tools that you are simply free to use. So if you're looking to develop your own startup or make your own product, so make sure to have a look onto this because it is holistic and it will also help you to find the right technology stack for your project in a very easy manner without having to spend a lot of time in communicating with the SMEs 
or the experts, and then finding upon the right stuff for that. So here is the GitHub repo, if you just want to have a look. And you can pretty much find the uh, browser PDF or the PNG or even the desktop wallpapers. And you can just start to have a look on it and find out the perfect service that you can use to integrate in your application. If you want to have authentication, you can use Firebase Auth. If you want to have a database, you can use a data store. If you want to have some analytics, you can use the crash analytics offered by Firebase. Everything is pretty much offered uh, by default by Google itself. So maybe just capitalize on that. If you don't like Google, then there is some other alternatives like AWS or Azure. You can even take a look onto that. So it's all your choice at the end of the day. And the last step is to actually design the technology. So for this step, you just take out a piece of paper and a marker and just divide it like so. So in each part of the grid, you will just write about the tools that you will use and what purpose they are actually going to serve right here. So this is one good way in which you can keep all your ideas in your mind on just a piece of paper. And you can simply brainstorm if that uh, is specifically working out in your case. If it is, well and good. If it is not, then you might need to find some other uh, technology stack for your own purpose. So. Now that you have discovered the word of the technology stack, you are just one step closer to building your application and taking the market by the storm. So in everything digital, just keep the user first and deliver an experience that completely delights everyone. So now we have got some pretty much nice examples. So you don't have to think of something complex or something of your own. Your primary focus should not be on anything, but rather than about trying out something that existing works and just start tearing it apart and analyzing its components. So there are some classic examples that I have in mind, e-commerce application, food delivery, productivity app. Uh, you can even design a shopping cart, maybe a video streaming service like YouTube or Vimeo, maybe a global chat application, maybe a distributed key value store, there are plenty of ideas and these are some good projects that can help you get started up. So try to understand the load of these projects that they must endure and what it must optimize for. So as a developer, take a look onto a few things like what is the requirement for latency? What is the requirement for throughput, the storage, the processing? Estimate the dimensions of your system. Uh, try to find out the technologies that run the different parts of your system break down your ideas into like few sub points so that you can convince someone else that yes, this technology stack is perfect for our choice. And then just lay out all these ideas in form of a proposal and just start building on it. This is literally the easiest way in which you can get your projects up and running without having to think a lot about the technology stack or the services that you're going to offer, but just sticking to the core of the idea, which is to serve the users and making everything possible for you to make that happen. So with this, we come to the close ending of this session. We had a very long talk and I'm quite glad that most of you had stuck to the end of this session. So if there are any questions, any doubts, any queries, you can just directly unmute yourself and we can directly start communicating. Uh, this is a Q&A &A part, so you can feel free to talk about anything that is in mind right now. Come on, guys. I am expecting some Hello, questions. Sir. Yeah. Hello, sir. Please go ahead. I would, say, yeah. I would like to ask you that uh, just now you mentioned that we should be looking at the reliability of the tech stack which we are using. So I would like to ask mm -hmm. that, uh, that if I'm changing, if I'm changing my mind to uh, switch from Django to Flask, so we should, uh, what are the, some of the resources we, from we can learn so that we should start uh, building our application from the, from the scratch as we are learning along with that. So how, what are some of the resources you can convey? Best resources? Okay, so, uh, okay, so yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, I will take a very basic example. So are you from the CS department? 
no IT department. Okay, uh, doesn't matter. So you will be landing up as an engineer or as a developer after your college. So uh, let us say that you are an engineer. Like after two or three years, you become a senior software engineer. Uh, so now you are a part of a team, and this team is working on a lot of products. Maybe it is a primary product that is offered by the company itself, or it is a client product. Whatever you have to code, you have to meet the requirements, and you have to write good quality and maintainable code. And now let us say that you got a requirement of developing another product for a client, and it is using the entirely different technology stack that you were using earlier. Maybe you were a React developer, and now you have to jump on something that you have never learned before. So uh, now you have given you have been given two options: either take a leave like of one or two months, learn the technology stack and come back to the job, or else just take a look onto the documentation and side by side start building up this stuff that you're required to do. So what exactly will you do here? So second option is better one, side by side um, learning and building something. Exactly, so basically as an engineer, we need to understand one thing. Documentation is a single source of truth. Uh, every course, every tutorial, every blog, every book is built upon the documentation. If you take out the documentation from the equation, we have no resource to learn from. So instead of just finding upon the sub resources or uh, sub domains of like having to learn a technology stack, why don't you straight away jump into the documentation and start learning about that? Most of the documentation that I have known or I have read are pretty much generic. They are very good to understand and make sense of and to get started with our own stuff. So as an engineer, like if I just take an example of some senior engineers, four or five years back, we did not have anything like Docker or Kubernetes. And now we are seeing that almost every company is making use of these cloud native technologies to run their applications. So they have not taken a break or they have not taken up a resource to learn something new. They just followed the documentation or at maximum, they just just followed some of the existing projects on GitHub or GitLab or some blogs or maybe even some stack overflow or some community threads to basically make sense of the technology that they are working on. So always keep your focus upon learning and building at the same time. If you're going into learning, like maybe take up some tutorial or maybe read up some book, there is a high chance that you might get stuck in a tutorial hell forever and you will never be able to come out of that. So instead of getting stuck into the tutorial hell, take the charge, learn and build alongside the same process. And this will help you to learn much faster, validate yourself much faster, and also build much faster. So I hope the question has been answered. Yeah, yeah, it's very clear now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Adarsh, as I'm a beginner, do I need to learn Node.js for backend or should I just use Firebase without this for backend? Now it is uh, a comparison between APIs and the serverless. So let me just highlight what the difference is here actually, because we have some time left. So APIs basically stand for application programming interfaces. And I just described before, it is an abstraction over the actual service that we are offering. So let's say that we want the client side user to basically query up some data. Let's say I have uh, the database of all the students in this university and with the and of their CGP as well. And I just want to query up some data to get the C, to get the name of the students who have a CGP up above a certain threshold. So I will be requesting this data from the client side. So how exactly is the backend going to work on that? So basically the backend will simply run a database query. It will fetch the data and it will just send it over the, to the client side. So how exactly is the front end communicating with the back end? So turns out they use something that we call as the hypertext transfer protocol messages. And these messages are pure JSON messages. So these are used in form of a data structure that we call as the JSON. And these JSON basically form the entire structure of these APIs, in specific the REST APIs. So REST stands for representation straight transfer. And basically the APIs that follow the REST architecture simply make use of these JSON data structures to communicate the data among each other. On the other hand, Firebase is pretty much serverless. And as the name suggests, it, is, it doesn't mean that we don't have any servers. 
it simply means that we don't have to take care of managing our own servers or deploying our own APIs on the server. Firebase gives us that option pretty much from the very basic or from the very scratch. So you can just configure Firebase. You can import the SDK. You can import the APIs that are offered by Firebase, and you can just use that onto the front end application without having any back end whatsoever. So it is just exactly what you are preferring. If you are preferring to have a very minimal back end or no back end at all, you can go with Firebase. You can even go with Amplify, which is a Firebase alternative offered by AWS. Amplify is much more cost intensive and much more reliable as well. But if you want to have a full control over your application with your own database, your own services, and all of that, maybe you can go with Node.js. So that is my understanding about this part. So for people who are really interested, this is how a normal architecture would look uh, for any software project. So we have got the front end. Uh, it is on React. It is a progressive web app. It is a uh, browser application. We have got an authentication. Well, on the backend, we are making use of Flask, Node.js, Elastic, and the REST architecture. The data layer is composed of the Google Drive, Postgres SQL, Redish for caching, Elastic, and we have got a CDN to basically serve all this data to our uh, user. So this is just one example of how a simple web application might look like. For a more complex web application, we have got this example. So we have got a backup databases, we have got a cluster IPs, and this much is pretty much deployed on Kubernetes that allows you to auto scale your applications. So this is how the technical architecture of some applications might look like. So you can just try to create your applications following this architecture rather than just jumping on the bandwagon with some random technologies that you just know of. Because after all, at the end of the day, your focus should be on the user rather than on the developer. So always keep in mind the technology that is really going to be beneficial for you in the long run. Uh, if there are any more questions, we still have like uh, 10 minutes left. So you can just speak about that right now. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah, hi. Sir, uh, can we secure an API without using authentication method, like uh, limiting API request? How can, uh, can you? Yeah, can you like uh, tell me the exact use case behind it for the very first uh, reason? So actually, I was building an application where I don't want to uh, use it to log in, but I want to limit their uh, request on my API. Okay. Okay, so basically, uh, you can make use of the timestamps. So these timestamps will basically uh, allow you to check uh, if the user who is sending all these requests are they legitimate or is it something like a bot behavior. Uh, other than that, you can make use of OAuth. So basically, OAuth is used for authorization, and the connections are always like uh, on the hypertext transfer protocol. So you can like make use of these services for your case. Otherwise, there are a lot of things in APIs like role-based access controls, uh, time stamping, paginations, and all of that. And that would allow you to secure your API without any sort of authentication or authorization whatsoever. Sir, uh, can we check that user by using uh, by uh, identifying their MAC addresses of their PC systems? I'm not so sure if that is allowed. <laughs> Because all of this is like stored in logs. Uh, these form a part of the analytics. And uh, from a very software perspective, all of this data will be going to the SRD team, the site reliability engineering team. And they are the ones who will be developing all sort of analytics and passing them down to the developer and the marketing team. So the software world isn't just about engineers. It is about software engineers. It is about site reliability engineers. It is about operations team. It is about DevOps team. So we have a lot of people who are taking care of all these things. Okay, sir, thanks. Yeah. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, 
if not, then we can just wind up with the session. So over to you. So I guess that was it, sir. No more questions are there. So yeah. So yes, I guess we are pretty so much, much at the end. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your time. We are so honored that you put us on priority, leaving behind your personal and professional stuffs. Thank you so much for your time and uh, coming us and giving us this workshop. Such an amazing and beautiful conclusion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the participants, for coming in the workshop. And uh, yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir.